All right, chapter three, project management. This is a really fun chapter and a lot of you are really gonna like it. Some of you will even go on in your careers and be full-time uh, project and program managers. And if you don't do it full-time, you will also, many of you have the opportunity to do uh, projects with the employers that you work with. Um, and so we'll get into what a project is, whether it's a full-time organization or whether it's a, a one-time uh, unique kind of task. But either way, um, many of you will be involved in project management at some point in your careers. So our learning objectives for chapter three are to learn how to use a Gantt chart for scheduling. We will draw an AON network diagram. That's activity on node network diagram. We're gonna complete a forward pass and a backward pass. Uh, we will determine the critical path of a project. We will calculate the variance of activity times. And then last but not least, we will crash a project. So a lot of these terms sound a little funny, like forward pass and backward pass and crashing, uh, but they'll all make sense by the end of uh, this chapter. All right, so for us to first talk about project management, we need to understand what a project is and what a project is not. So a project is a temporary and often customized initiative that consists of many smaller tasks and activities that are coordinated and completed to finish the entire initiative on time and within budget. Okay, so projects are, here's, here's a couple examples of what a project is. Building a bridge, building a house, implementing an ERP system, a new product launch. These are all projects. They're unique. They happen generally one time. You complete the project and then you're done. What is not project management or a project is what I do for the major for 95% of my day job. I wake up, I check emails, I make some phone calls, I have uh, conference calls, I call vendors and negotiate contracts, I read some uh, terms and conditions and do red lines, I check in on my employees and make sure that they're getting their initiatives completed. Um, I do financial planning. Um, and so all of these things that I do are not a project. They're just day-to-day -day tasks that are part of my job. They are not significant projects that are unique that need to have a project plan put together. I just wake up and do them. Maybe I put a little bit of uh, you know thought into you know what needs to be done one week out or two week out. Uh, but I do not need to put together a project plan to do my type of day-to-day -day role. So when we talk about project management, um, so, so that's the difference between a project and what a project is and what a project is. So now let's talk about project management. This involves all of the activities associated with planning, scheduling, and controlling those unique big projects. So the first phase of project management is project planning. This is where you establish your objectives, define the project, create the work breakdown structure, determine your resources, and form your organization. So a lot of time and effort goes into the planning phase. This is where we decide what is our project. And equally as important, you define what is our project not. So if your project is to build a house, it is not also to do the landscaping, uh, build a fence, um, put in a pool, if your project is to just build the house. And it is very important in the workplace to make sure that you don't get scope creep. So that's why defining the project and establishing the objectives are so important because it helps to keep people on task with here's what the project is. Okay, in project planning, you also create a work breakdown structure, define your resources. So at this point of the project, very early on in the stage, what you're saying is, I need three engineers. I need three people from marketing. I need two people from operations, two people from supply chain. You don't assign resources yet. You're just dis determining how many people you need on the team. A project organization is often a temporary structure using specialists from the company and headed by a project manager who coordinates the activities. And they are generally someone who work in the organization as well. So I've been on numerous projects in my career. They have assigned me as the supply chain or operations representative to be the specialist to speak on behalf of the team, the supply chain team or the materials team or the operations team. And you'll pick an engineer or two, or you'll pick someone from marketing. So you're gonna pick people to work on these temporary projects 
They are specialists from their department and from the company, and they're the ones who will be assigned uh, to the project plan. Last thing on this page before we move on to the next. A permanent structure uh, within an organization is called a matrix organization, a matrix organization. That would be organizations that are always doing projects. Okay, so many of us won't go work in a matrix organization, but some people will. And so you'll go from one project to the next project to the next project. So a great example of this would be the construction industry where you build a bridge and then you move on to build a commercial property and then you go on to build a road, whatever it may be. Um, if you're in construction, almost everything you do is a project and you'll see why later because there's so many steps that need to be done one after the next after the next. And so it, you absolutely have to have a project plan put together to support that project. Okay, so one of the steps of the project planning phase is to create a work breakdown structure. And this is a hierarchical description of a project into more and more detailed components. So level one is what's the big picture project. Level two is some of the big picture tasks. Level three, everything that's needed to complete level two. And you work your way all the way down um, of all the steps and levels that are needed to complete that project, which is level one. So in this instance, it's develop Windows 8 operating system. That's, that's the objective, that's the, that's, the, that's the project plan. We're going to develop Windows 8 operating system. Level two are all the big picture tasks that need to be done in order for us to complete our level one tasks. So software design, cost management plan, system testing, all of that. In general, the higher level the task is typically performed by a team and the lower level tasks are completed by an individual. So one person can check to see if it's compatible with Windows XP. Another person can check to see if it's compatible with Windows Vista. They will go and work on that task themselves, and then they will report back to the team. Okay, phase two in project management is project scheduling. And this is where you identify precedence relationships, sequence your activities, determine activity times and costs, estimate material and worker requirements, and determine the critical activities. This is where you're going to spend a significant portion of your project planning and scheduling in these tasks right here. This is where you've got to really nail it if, because if you get these wrong, your project will be wrong as well. You're either going to have the wrong costs or the wrong times, or you're going to forget steps that are critical. And so this is the scheduling phase where you take into consideration everything that is critical that needs to get done for the project. So an example of Identifying precedence relationships, you have to think what's step one, then step two, then step three, then step four, and you work your way all through all of the steps that are needed for that project. And you're going to put them into a sequence of events. Precedence means something that comes before another task can be completed. It precedes the other task. So using a very broad example of constructing a home again, you have to lay the foundation first before you can put up the frames and before you put up and you can't put up the roof until you put up the frames. So there's a sequence of events there that has to take place. Step one, step two, step three. And you can't get to those final steps until you've done everything in front of them. In this course, the precedence relationships and the sequence of, of activities will all be given to you, as well as the activity times and costs. When you're working on projects in your career, they won't. You're going to have to determine what goes before other steps. What, what are my, um, what's my sequence of events? What are my steps? So what's step one, then step two, then step three. You're also going to have to get accurate time and cost estimates. So you're going to have to go out there and say, okay, how much is this step going to cost me? If we do it internally, how many hours does it take? How much do those people make per hour? So what's my total internal expenses? If it's a job or a task that's done by subcontractors, you're going to have to ask them for bids. You're going to say, how long is it going to take um, to do this task and how much money is it going to cost me? So you'll get those proposals. So you're going to determine your time and activity costs. And all of that is done in the project scheduling phase. One of the key outputs of the project scheduling phase is various different charts. And the most, um, the most well-known one in project management and project scheduling is the Gantt chart. So it's named after Henry Gantt. Uh, who won the president presidential citation for his um, use of this chart during World War One? 
There's lots of other different charts that can be used in project management, but this is without question the most used project management and project scheduling tool. Um, you can see they're very easy to use and to interpret. So just by looking at the one that you see on the screen, you can tell that this Gantt chart is telling us that this activity, this entire project, is going to take us 19 weeks to complete. 19 weeks to complete. So we know it's going to take 19 weeks based off of the Gantt chart. You can see that your first activity is get the contract negotiated and then get it signed. So this is step one. This is step two. Your longest activity time based off of the Gantt chart, just by looking at this visually, is to, to purchase the long lead procurement items. So it's got the longest bar graph. That means it's the longest step in this process. Now this one's very simplistic. It's only about seven steps. So it's easy to see, but that's what's, that's the beauty of the Gantt chart. They're very easy to make and interpret and follow along with. Microsoft project is very easy to use. I once went up to uh, Los Angeles. I did a, a two or three day certification on how to use Microsoft project because when the manufacturing firm that I worked for was going to implement an ERP system. We were going from an MRP system to an ERP system. They wanted me to be the program manager. So I had this entire project that I had to oversee. And so I needed to understand how to use Microsoft projects so that I could create Gantt charts and help the team along, making sure that we were on track with all of the different sequences of activities that needed to happen. And then also with our time and our costs. So I got a certification. I am not an expert, but I certainly was able to understand it and manage a project after that couple day uh, training program. So Microsoft Project is very useful and a lot of uh, people know how to use it, interpret it, and it's a, it's a really um, it's a really great tool. Okay, phase three. Phase three is project controlling. And this is once the project has started, you're now doing whatever your project is, whether it's construction or a, a software conversion or, or Again, whatever it may be. Um, so within project controlling, you're going to have your detailed cost breakdowns for each task. You're going to be looking at um, how are we spending our hours, our, our time, uh, our money, and you're going to be looking for any kind of variances to make sure that things are on track. If things are not on track, you're going to revise your plans. You're going to redo your schedule. You're going to expedite materials or work overtime or whatever it is you need to do to get that project back on track. So this is the project controlling phase. Okay, so real quickly, an overview of when we do project planning, scheduling, and controlling. So before the project ever starts, that's when we plan the project. That's when we define the project, create the team, develop the work breakdown structure. At the start of the project, this is when we put all the activities uh, in the sequence of, an, of, of events, so step one, step two, step three. This is where we assign people to the actual project and we schedule their time and those resources. And then during the project is when we control it to make sure that everything is going according to, to plan, both with time, uh, with costs, and with quality. And if things are not going well, then we put those corrective measures in place. Okay, so for project uh, managers, there are a couple principles that uh, you, need to, you need to have. So you need to be able to manage people individually and as a project team. So I'll take the project that I led, for example. There was about 30 people assigned to this project because there was a couple people from every single department who had a, a role in it. So I managed them individually. I would call Bob and, hey, Susie, you know, how are you doing with your task? You've got three days left before it needs to be completed. So I would manage them individually to make sure their tasks were going to be completed on time. I would also hold weekly meetings because we had a six month lead time that we wouldn't have this project done. So we met every week as a team and I would give an update on how things were going for this entire project. So I would manage people individually and as a team. Managers need to be able to reinforce the commitment and excitement for the project team. And I know it sounds a little funny to say, hey, you need to get people excited to work on projects. But someday, fast forward 10, 15, 20 years, and you've been working in your job for a while, and you get asked to be on a project team, a project team many times is just in addition to your day job, in addition to the stuff that you've already got to do. You don't necessarily get to relax your um, your day-to-day -day activities because you're going to work on this project team. So it's just more work. And so people aren't always passionate about it. 
And so you have to keep them excited. You have to help them to see the, the end goal, how it's going to benefit the organization and keep them excited and on task. You've got to keep everyone informed. You do that through really good communication. You can do it through emails, conference calls, meetings, or a combination of all three, but you've got to keep everyone informed. And then you have to empower the project team as well. You do have to give them the power that as long as they're going to meet the objectives to let them do it their way instead of necessarily your way. So down at the bottom of the screen, you can see the project management triangle. And really this is you know looking at cost, qualities, schedules. These are your performance objectives. You really need to find that balance. You don't want to make a project happen so quickly that you um, spend way too much money making sure that it happens quickly or that your quality uh, deteriorates because you're cutting corners. So you've got to have that balance, that, that equilibrium of a triangle to make sure that everything is taken into consideration and done, done according to the plan. You want to be on track with your costs, your schedule, and your quality, and you don't want to let any of them slide, and you also don't want to get um, uh, you know, out of hand on any of them, right? You just want to, you want to be right there where you're supposed to be for your costs, your quality, and your schedule. Okay, some, some contributors and impediments to project success. I'm not going to go over all of these, but there's a few things that you absolutely have to have for your project to go well. You have to have good top leadership uh, support. Uh, if, if you need more money or you need more time um, or you need to expedite materials, whatever it may be, you've got to have executive support who are uh, backing you and this project to where they will give you the resources that you need. You have to have a really good project. Um, you have to have a really good defined project. So you can't have that scope creep, um, making sure that everyone knows what the task at hand is and the, and the things that are not part of that project is critical to project success. Um, you've got to have good communication. You've got to uh, manage people both individually and as a team. So you've got to have really good communication on that team. And then you also have to have really good data. You have to have great estimates of your time, of your costs, of um, you know who's doing what. So you've got to have great data accuracy to make sure that your project goes well. And the impediments of a project success are essentially you just take everything and do, you do the opposite of that. So you have bad leadership support, you have bad data, you have bad communication, you've got team members who don't get along, uh, you've got scope creep. So those are all the things that'll make a project go in the wrong direction if you don't have it. Okay, so ethical issues. We'll talk about ethical issues in a little bit in almost every single chapter, but with uh, with project managers, uh, the, they absolutely fall under the same kind of pressure and constraints uh, that people in other professions do as well. Uh, so they're gonna they're gonna face you know issues every day. Whether it's hey we're falling behind on this project, how do we get caught up? Do we cut corners on quality? Do we spend more than we should be? Uh, whatever it may be. Um, they run into, they've got pressure every single day. So the Project Management Institute has established an ethical code to deal with many of the problems that they face. That could be gifts from contractors not allowing those, um, pressure to alter reports and mask some of the delays that are, that are uh, being encountered, um, pressure to compromise quality to meet schedules. So these are all the things that program managers face. Uh, in the very first slide, I said that some of you might want to do uh, project management as a career. And if you do want to do project management as a career, the uh, PMP certification is absolutely something you should consider and entertain getting after you've started working uh, for a couple of years. Um, whenever someone does project management full time, you'll generally see a PMP after their, you know, their, their name and then PMP uh, initials. The PMP certification takes many years to get. So just like the certification I have, which is a CPSM, Certified Professional in Supply Chain Management, it took me about two and a half years to get that certification. I took five exams and I had to be uh, a supply chain professional for many years before I could even qualify to get it. Same thing for the PMP certification. You've got to work on some projects. You've got to be uh, established in your career. And, it, and then there are many tests to pass. So if you are interested in a career in project management, then I would highly recommend looking into the PMP certification. 